Here is our second lecture on radiation biology. Let's look at the objectives for today. After today's lecture, students will understand deterministic and stochastic effects. Students will know about environmental and radiation influences on cancer induction. Students will understand the effects of radiation exposure on the developing fetus. Students will be able to discuss whole body response to acute radiation exposure and distinguish between hematopoietic, gastrointestinal, and neurovascular syndromes. We will end with the main conclusions of the BS7 report. Just like the molecular and cellular systems we saw in the first lecture on radiation biology, an organ system's response to radiation depends not only on the dose, dose rate, and LET of the radiation, but also on the relative radio sensitivities of the cells that comprise the organ, the type of damage to the organ, and the ability of the organ to repair damage. In the case of organ systems, response is measured in terms of morphologic and functional changes rather than changes in cell survival and kinetics. Let's look at what happens when an organ system is damaged by radiation. The damage could be healed by means of cellular regeneration and repair, or the damage could result in tissue necrosis. Regeneration refers to replacement of the damaged cells in the organ by cells of the same type, thereby replacing the lost functional capacity. Repair refers to the replacement of the damaged cells by fibrotic scar tissue, in which case the functionality of the organ system is compromised. This figure outlines the responses of the organ system to radiation damage. The response of an organ system to radiation damage can be thought of as a deterministic effect. These are effects where severity increases with dose and there is a dose threshold below which no damage occurs. Radio sensitivity of an organ depends on the radio sensitivity of the cells it contains and the location of these cells within the organ. If the parenchyma of the organ has radiosensitive cells, damage is likely to be apparent very soon after radiation exposure. However, if the parenchyma has radioresistant cells, damage will likely occur first in the supporting vasculature with effects of reduced blood supply only becoming apparent later. Relative radiosensitivity of various tissues and organs and the primary mechanism for radiation-induced parenchyma hypoplasia is shown in this table. Organ systems that exhibit notable radiation effects include the skin, reproductive organs, lens of the eye, and the hematopoietic, gastrointestinal, and central nervous systems. In the following slides, we will discuss each of these organ system responses in more detail. Radiation effects on skin are the most well-known of all organ system effects. When x-rays were first used for medical applications, it was common to look for the onset of skin erythema as a measurement tool for the amount of radiation delivered. Early radiation effects occur in the outer skin layer, the epidermis. These effects include erythema, inflammation, dry desquamation, and moist desquamation. Late effects occur in the deeper skin layer, the dermis, and include atrophy, fibrosis, changes in pigmentation, ulceration, necrosis, and cancer. Damage also affects accessory structures resulting in epilation and sweat and sebaceous gland damage. Those threshold for skin effects is approximately one gray. The onset of various skin effects are based on those levels listed here. In general, erythema and temporary epilation occur at the lowest dose level between 2 to 6 gray. At dose levels between 6 to 10 gray, there is more serious erythema, and at 15 gray, the skin displays a severe erythema with dry desquamation. Doses above 20 gray result in more intense effects and permanent skin damage requiring skin grafts. At between 20 to 50 gray, there is intense erythema, acute radiation dermatitis, moist desquamation, edema, dermal hypoplasia, vascular damage, permanent epilation, permanent pigment changes, and destruction of sweat glands. When skin is exposed to more than 50 gray, the above effects occur in addition to ulcerations and necrosis. Note that the timeline and separation of these effects is compressed as dose is increased. These effects also depend on dose rate. The table is a summary of these effects at different doses with a time frame for the onset of the effects also shown. There are a few physical and biological variables that can substantially modify the severity of radiation-induced skin damage. These include size of the exposed area, anatomical location, fractionation of the dose, patient health, and medications. Details are shown in the table. 
Here are a few types of skin damage. The National Cancer Institute has defined four grades of radiation-induced skin damage, where grade 1 is the least severe and grade 4 is the most severe. This figure illustrates several grades of radiation-induced skin reactions from exposure to diagnostic and interventional imaging procedures. A three-dimensional view of the spectrum of skin damage from radiation is also shown on the right. On the next few slides, we can see a few more pictures of radiation damage. While we look at some of these examples of skin damage, it is important to note that skin doses from diagnostic X-ray examinations are unlikely to reach the minimum threshold level for these skin effects. However, radiation levels resulting in skin damage have been noted in the literature for several types of interventional radiology and cardiology procedures. In this example, a woman developed this lesion on her mid-back after undergoing two PTCA and stent placements within a month. The photograph shows well-marginated focal erythema and moist desquamation. The distinct margins are indicative of fluoroscopic radiation, which is delivered as a collimated beam. Though the actual skin dose is unknown in this case, it was likely over 20 gray. This example shows a late skin irradiation effect. Following three sequential interventional procedures, this patient developed pronounced erythema at three weeks that progressed to moist desquamation. An area of deep ulceration was present at three months and is still present in this photograph taken over a year after the exposure. The overall shape of the lesion is caused by two sequential procedures that use nearly the same tube position. The skin dose was estimated as approximately 20 gray. Another skin effect example is chronic dermatitis of the hand caused by continual exposure at low dose levels. Symptoms include intractable ulcers, curled and cracked nails, and dry cracked skin resulting from a total exposure exceeding 20 gray obtained over many years in small daily doses of 10 to 20 milligray. This photograph shows the hands of one of the first radiologists, M.K. Kasabian. He used fluoroscopy extensively and frequently inserted his hands in the primary X-ray beam. In this photo, he was only 33 years old at the time and had used fluoroscopy for over seven years. He eventually lost several fingers on one hand. The next organ system is the reproductive system. Human reproductive organs are particularly sensitive to radiation. This topic has been studied extensively with animals and verified in many human studies based on radiation therapy patients, radiation accident victims, and volunteer research subjects. Male and female gonads respond differently to radiation based on differences in germ cell progression. For males, the stem cell spermatogonia is the most radiosensitive phase of cell development. The maturing sperm cells are relatively radioresistant, therefore after an acute exposure, radiation effects will not be seen for several weeks. A dose of 0.5 gray results in temporary sterility and 6 gray can cause permanent sterility. The duration of temporary sterility is dose dependent with recovery beginning at one year and can go as long as 3.5 years after doses of 1 and 2 gray respectively. For females, the intermediate-sized ovarian follicles are most radiosensitive. A dose of 1.5 gray can cause temporary sterility, and greater than 10 gray is required to cause permanent sterility in females prior to puberty. Doses of approximately 2 to 3 gray can cause permanent sterility in premenopausal women over 40 years old. Gonadal doses that are obtained from diagnostic X-ray exams generally do not exceed 50 mg, which is well below the threshold listed here. Radiation exposure to the eye can cause damage to the cells within the lens. Since the lens has no mechanism for cell removal, the damaged cells migrate toward the posterior pole and accumulate. This collection of cells causes an opacity in the normally transparent lens causing a cataract. The posterior pole location of the cataract generally indicates that it was caused by radiation instead of resulting from some other cause. The latent period between exposure and formation of a cataract will depend on the dose received, with higher doses resulting in faster cataract formation. However, the latent period is at least one year in length. Note that the latent period is inversely related to dose. The threshold dose for cataract formation from a single acute radiation exposure is 2 gray with 5 gray for chronic exposures. The threshold dose for protracted exposure is higher. 
4 gray over 2 months, and 5.5 gray over 4 months. Again, the doses required for cataract formation are much higher than those encountered in diagnostic X-ray imaging. For reference, a head CT scan results in a lens dose of 25 to 50 milligray to the patient. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission limit is less than 150 milligray per year for occupational radiation workers. ICRP's recent review of the scientific evidence has led the Commission to propose a much more conservative occupational dose limit of 20 millisieverts per year, averaged over five years, with no single year exceeding 50 millisieverts. A complete discussion of these and other organ and tissue reactions can be found in the current draft of the ICRP report for 2011. A summary of this report of threshold doses in tissues and organs in adults exposed to acute, fractionated or protracted, and chronic irradiation is reproduced in the tables. Let's now look at stochastic effects of cancer incidence in adults. Cancer is not a rare disease and is the second most likely cause of death after cardiovascular disease. It is the most important delayed somatic effect of radiation exposure. Cancer is a stochastic or probabilistic effect. The probability of the effect does not depend on a dose threshold since it is believed that even small doses can cause cancer. Nevertheless, radiation is a relatively weak carcinogen at low doses encountered in occupational and diagnostic settings. According to a report on cancer incidence in the U.S. from the American Cancer Society from 2011, the lifetime probability of developing an invasive cancer is 41%. Probability of dying from cancer is about half of that, 22%. Annual cancer incidence and mortality age adjusted rates for the U.S. population are shown in the last two bullets. As a summary, the baseline lifetime risk of cancer incidence, mortality, and average years of life lost are shown in the table. Average years of life lost is shown in parentheses. In general, cancer arises from abnormal cell division. It is thought to occur as a multi-step process in which the initiation of damage in a single cell leads to a pre-neoplastic stage followed by a sequence of events that permit the cell to successfully proliferate. There are several factors that increase cancer risk in adult populations. Some of these factors are environmental while others are radiation-induced. Environmental factors include tobacco use, alcohol abuse, diet, sexual behavior, air pollution, and bacterial and viral infections. For example, for men, relative risk of developing lung cancer is 20 to 40 times greater in smokers than non-smokers. Radiation-related risk factors depend on radiation quality, dose rate and fractionation, latency and age and gender-related effects, as well as genetic susceptibility. When it comes to radiation quality effects, high LET radiation is more effective in producing DNA damage and is less likely to be faithfully repaired than damage produced by low LET radiation. Radiation-induced cell damage at lower dose rates is less than at higher dose rates, and also fractionation reduces damage to healthier cells. Regarding latency, this is the period between exposure and clinical expression of disease. Latency and the risk of radiation-induced cancers vary with the type of cancer, gender, and age at the time of exposure. For example, the risk of ovarian cancer from an acute exposure at age 10 is approximately three times greater than if the exposure occurred at age 50. For leukemia, the minimal latent period is 2 to 3 years. Latent periods for solid tumors range from 5 to 40 years, with a period of expression for some cancers longer than 50 years. There are some genetic susceptibilities that contribute to cancer induction. Women with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations have 5 times higher lifetime risk of breast cancer than women in the general population. The general population has 12% risk, and women with BRCA1 and 2 have 60% risk. Ataxia telangiectasia AT is a rare recessive childhood genetic disorder that occurs in one or two of every 100,000 people. Patients with AT mutation are at substantially higher risk of infection and of developing cancer, especially leukemias and lymphomas, than the general population. These patients are also hypersensitive to ionizing radiation exposure because of defective DNA repair mechanisms.
Let's look at some of the data sources and research that helps our understanding of current cancer risk. While it has been well established that at high doses radiation can cause cancer, the relationship between cancer induction and low dose radiation in the diagnostic and occupational dose range is uncertain. So far, animal and epidemiological studies show that the risk of cancer at low dose levels is small. The populations that form the basis of the epidemiological research into radiation-induced effects come from four principal sources. Lifespan study cohort of survivors of the atomic bomb explosions in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, patients with medical exposures during treatment of a variety of neoplastic and non-neoplastic diseases, persons with occupational exposures, and populations who live in areas with high natural background radiation. It is important to know that at low doses of less than 100 millisieverts or 100 milligree, it is very difficult to detect small increases in cancer rates in a population because radiation is a weak carcinogen. For the last few minutes, we have been learning about radiation effects on adults. To study radiation effects on the developing fetus, we can divide the gestational period into three stages. There is the pre-implantation stage, which is an all or nothing response stage. There is an organogenesis stage where the primary effect is on the central nervous system from low LET radiations of less than 250 milligree. The children of atomic bomb survivors show significant increase in microcephaly when irradiated in this stage. And finally, a fetal growth stage. This is after 50 days post-conception. At this stage, there is negligible radiation-induced prenatal death and congenital abnormalities. The figure shows the different stages and some effects. Let's first consider teratogenic effects on the developing fetus. Teratogenic effects are birth defects in children born to mothers exposed to teratogenic agents like radiation. A lot of data for this effect comes from population studies of survivors of the atomic bomb attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The data shows that birth defects in children born to survivors was dependent on gestational age of the fetus at the time of irradiation. The main effects were microcephaly, a retardation in mental capacity, and a reduction in IQ scores for those that were otherwise normal. There was a dose dependence of approximately 25 points per gray for reduction in IQ scores. The time period of exposure for these effects was at the 8th and 25th weeks post-conception. In addition, it was found that there is a threshold of 100 milligray below which the risks were negligible. So based on this information, we can say that recommendation of therapeutic abortion is not justified for exposures less than 100 milligray regardless of gestational age. Let's look next at carcinogenic effects on the developing fetus. According to a 2009 National Cancer Institute report, a newborn male and female have a 0.25% and 0.22% probability of developing cancer by age 15 respectively. Most of these cancers are leukemia and central nervous system neoplasms. While there have been several studies over the years showing a correlation between childhood leukemia and solid tumors and in utero diagnostic radiation, no childhood leukemias and only one childhood cancer was observed among the in utero irradiated children of the atomic bomb survivors. In addition, a cohort study of 30,000 exposed mothers in the United Kingdom found no increase in childhood leukemias. This evidence was also supported by animal studies. To be cautious, the U.S. regulatory agencies limit occupational radiation exposure to the fetus to no more than 5 millisieverts during the gestational period, provided that the dose rate does not substantially exceed 0.5 millisieverts in any one month. When it comes to radiation-induced hereditary effects, there was conclusive evidence as early as 1927 in fruit flies. Additional studies of millions of mice in the Mega Mouse project confirmed the following. First, radiation is a mutagenic agent. Second, most mutations are harmful to the organism. And third, radiation does not produce unique mutations. However, hereditary effects following prenatal exposure has not been demonstrated in any human study to date. A lot of the current research was based on studying the 70,000 offspring of atomic bomb survivors in Japan as well as offspring of cancer survivors treated with radiotherapy. It was found that there was no increased risk above natural incidence for malformations, neonatal deaths, stillbirths, chromosomal abnormality, or gene changes.
So far, we have looked at the effect of radiation exposures coming from external sources. On this slide, we can consider the effect of internal radionuclide exposures on the fetus. These are exposures coming from radiation within the body of the mother due to administered radionuclides. Radionuclides administered to pregnant women may cross the placenta or may not. One radionuclide that crosses the placenta is radioiodine. The fetal thyroid begins to concentrate iodine after 11th and 12th weeks of conception. The effect on fetal thyroid is ablation if the dose administered is high or hypothyroidism for low administered doses. This table shows various activities of radionuclides absorbed in fetal thyroid. The risk of in utero radiation exposure can be placed in perspective by considering this table showing the probability of birthing a healthy child after a given dose to the fetus. The last row shows exposures to 100 mg of radiation with the probabilities shown. Doses lower than 100 mg and perhaps as high as 200 mg are generally thought to carry negligible risk compared with the reported occurrence of congenital abnormalities in live born children. Recommendation of therapeutic abortion for fetal doses less than 100 mg, regardless of gestational age, would not usually be justified. It is important to know that fetal doses from diagnostic X-ray and nuclear medicine examinations are typically much lower than 50 mg. So far, most of the radiation exposures we've looked at involved partial body irradiation. Let's now look at whole body irradiation. Depending on the radiosensitivity of the cells exposed, the body can withstand rather large doses of radiation with minimal effects when only part of the body is exposed. However, in the case of whole body exposure at high radiation doses, effects can be severe. They include nausea and vomiting, bleeding and death, with severity of the effects increasing with the dose level. The sequence of effects resulting from a single whole body radiation exposure event is known as acute radiation syndrome or ARS. Acute radiation syndrome consists of three sub-syndromes whose occurrence depends on the level of radiation exposure. These syndromes are hematopoietic, gastrointestinal, and neurovascular. These are not effects that you would see in diagnostic X-ray exposures. Instead, acute radiation syndrome can result from nuclear weapon detonation or a nuclear accident exposure. For example, the Chernobyl nuclear reactor meltdown in 1986 caused 30 cases of acute radiation syndrome and deaths. Acute radiation syndromes follow a predictable sequence of four phases. They are known as prodromal, latent, manifest illness, and recovery or death. The prodromal phase occurs first within the first six hours after exposure. Symptoms include nausea and vomiting, headache and diarrhea. The higher the dose, the earlier and more intense the symptoms, with a lower threshold of 0.5 to 1 gray whole body exposure. The symptoms subside during the next phase. This latent phase can last up to four weeks with long latent periods for lower doses and shorter periods for higher doses. After the latent period, organ system damage becomes apparent in the manifest illness phase. The symptoms include the return of prodromal illness and clinical expression of organ system damage depending on the level of exposure. If the patient does not die after two to three weeks of manifest illness, they will likely recover. This figure summarizes the effects experienced in each phase and timelines involved. The table is a summary of clinical findings of prodromal radiation syndrome. Let's look at each sub-syndrome more closely. The hematopoietic syndrome occurs at the lowest dose range. This syndrome is based on the relative radiosensitivity of hematopoietic stem cells in bone marrow. A threshold dose as low as 0.5 to 10 gray will result in a decrease in blood cell count. Patients with whole body doses 2 gray or lower will generally recover. For doses of 2 gray, the timeline of prodromal, latent, and manifest illness phases follows the maximum time intervals with about six weeks until death. As doses increase, the time intervals shorten, and at doses greater than eight gray, death is likely within one to two weeks without treatment, which is generally a bone marrow transplant. Even with effective stem cell therapy, it is unlikely that patients will survive doses in excess of 12 gray because of irreversible damage to the gastrointestinal tract and the vasculature. In the absence of medical care, 
the human LD5060, the dose that would be expected to kill 50% of an exposed population within 60 days, is approximately 3.5 to 4.5 gray to the bone marrow. The LD5060 may extend to 5 to 6 gray with supportive care, such as the use of transfusions and antibiotics, and may be as high as 6 to 8 gray with effective use of hematopoietic growth factors in an intensive care setting. At the next highest dose range, the gastrointestinal syndrome occurs. This results from radiation damage to crypt stem cells in the intestinal mucosa. When damaged, these cells no longer reproduce and the intestinal lining is no longer able to function. The dose range is 10 to 50 gray with 10 gray as the lower threshold for the onset of symptoms. Doses of 12 gray or more are always fatal. The time interval from exposure to death is between 5 to 12 days. The neurovascular syndrome corresponds to the highest dose levels with a threshold of 50 gray. The prodromal, latent, and manifest illness phases are compressed to 2 to 3 days. There is cardiovascular shock with fluid loss into extravascular tissue. The patient dies within 2 to 5 days. This figure shows the relationships among the various syndromes. To finish up, the BS7 report is a good summary of the general points of agreement that are consistent with the results from the atomic bomb survivors' lifespan studies. The main conclusions are that when humans are exposed to radiation, risk varies according to cancer site, risk is greater when exposures occur at younger ages, risk is greater for females than males, and solid cancer risk is consistent with a linear, no threshold function of dose when all cancers are combined. Leukemia risk is consistent with a non-linear function of dose. With the exception of leukemia, for which there is a fairly well-defined risk interval following exposure, risk remains elevated for 50 plus years after exposure. And finally, there is no convincing epidemiological evidence of radiation causing genetic effects. Let's finish up with a few questions. First question, which of these statements is not correct when it comes to irradiation of the skin? First choice, greater than 50 gray, possibility of genetic effects. Second choice, 2 to 6 gray, erythema, temporary epilation. Third choice, 6 to 10 gray, more serious erythema. Fourth choice, 15 gray, severe erythema, dry desquamation. The wrong statement here is the first choice, which says that at greater than 50 gray, there is possibility of genetic effects. Next question, which of these statements is wrong based on the BS7 summary of radiation effects? First choice, risk varies based on cancer site. Second choice, except for leukemia, risk of other cancers declined 50 plus years after exposure. Third choice, risk is greater at younger ages. Fourth choice, risk is greater for females than males. The wrong statement here is the second choice which says that except for leukemia, risk of other cancers declined 50 plus years after exposure. Next question. A worker is exposed to a whole body dose of 3 gray during a radiation accident. Which of these acute radiation syndromes is expected? First choice, gastrointestinal syndrome. Second choice, hematopoietic syndrome. Third choice, neurovascular syndrome. Fourth choice, prodromal syndrome. The correct choice is hematopoietic syndrome. Next question. A patient comes to radiology and has a CT exam of the abdomen pelvis with a reported CTDI of 10 mg. The patient is later found to be six weeks pregnant. What is the most appropriate course of action? First choice, recommend a therapeutic abortion because the baby has a risk of malformations. Second choice, do nothing because there will be prenatal death anyway. Third choice, counsel the patient that at the dose levels used in diagnostic imaging, the risk to the fetus is very low and the therapeutic abortion is not justified. The correct choice is the third choice, counsel the patient that at the dose levels used in diagnostic imaging, the risk to the fetus is very low and the therapeutic abortion is not justified. This is the last slide. Thank you for watching this presentation.